Welcome to our service this morning, and you may be as surprised as I am to be sitting down and watching another online service. I had hoped and prayed that these were long behind us, and that anything we did was purely for the support of the church, not because we had to. And despite the fact that we're sitting down and preparing and watching an online service in in isolation and disconnected from each other. I hold on to this profound truth that no matter how disconnected we are, no matter how much isolation we find ourselves in, we are never disconnected from the love of God. And it is my prayer as we worship together that something of God's underpinning love, the breadth of his love, the width of his love, the height of his love, will be your experience as we worship together. And to remind us of that love this morning, I'm going to light the Christ candle. And in lighting the Christ candle, it reminds us that Jesus is the light of the world. And no matter how dark the world actually gets, the light of Christ is always brighter. And as we begin our service this morning, I want to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first Australians and the traditional custodians of the lands on which we work, learn, live and worship. And we pay our respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. I also want to acknowledge the commitment of the Uniting Church to the process of reconciliation and justice. Hear the call to worship. Our God is an abundant God. The dimensions of God's love are broader, longer, deeper, higher than we can understand. And yet, can it be, we are invited to live our lives in the fullness of God. Glory to God in the church. Glory to God in Jesus. Glory throughout the generations and all millennia. Glory to God. Amen. God, who is large enough to fill everything, no matter how high or broad or long or deep, we worship you today. God, who can ease into small spaces and find us when we need you, we worship you today. God, who is alongside your people, we worship you today. Amen. Majesty, worship his majesty unto Jesus. Be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority flows from his throne unto his own, his anthem raised. Worship His majesty, unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority, flows from His throne unto His own. Oh, 
Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. Majesty, Majesty. worship His majesty. majesty, unto Jesus. Let us pray our prayers of confession. Sometimes we feel that if we don't hold on to what we have, we will lose it. So we don't share what we can. Sometimes we make selfish decisions that make things harder for other people. Sometimes we feel that we are not enough. Loving God, we confess that we have not always trusted you, that we have not always believed in you, that we have not always been wise, that we have not always sought after your love. Forgive us and look upon us again that we might offer praise that is worthy of your name. Have mercy, God, we pray. Amen. Amen. And hear the assurance of forgiveness. God's love is more than we can know. God works powerfully to do more than we can ask or imagine. We are loved by God. Our sins are forgiven. Be at peace. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Amen. Amen. John 6, 1-21 Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. So Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, Even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes, thousands of them. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God and distributed them to the people. After he did the same with the fish and they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, Now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps of bread left over. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, Surely 
He is the prophet we have been expecting. Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, so he slipped away into the hills by himself. That evening, Jesus' disciples went down to the shore to wait for him. But as darkness fell and Jesus still hadn't come back, they got into the boat and headed across the lake toward Capernaum. Soon a gale swept up upon them and the sea grew very rough. They had rowed three or four miles when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the boat. They were terrified, but he called out to them. Don't be afraid, I am here. Then they were eager to let him in the boat and immediately they arrived at their destination. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. If you've been into alien movies, you'll know one of the catch cries in most alien movies is take me to your leader. Where the alien encounters a human and that question is asked. It's the question that I kind of would like today, not take me to your leader, but who defines what leads your life? The question I could ask is, take me to your king. The world in which we live is a very hungry place. People are hungry for food, for jobs, for love, for care. And my perspective is that when you open the pages of the Bible, it highlights that the Bible knows what we know deep down inside ourselves, but are unwilling to acknowledge. And that is that we have a spiritual void within us. And what we do is that we fill that spiritual void with food and money and clothes and qualifications and toys and cars and technology. And we sadly think that the more stuff we own, the more it defines who we are. And all it really results in is that we end up with more and more stuff that we don't know what to do with. And so we end up hiring storage bins in which to put the stuff which reflects that our life is becoming more and more fragmented and separated. Now, this really is a first world problem. The problem that says that I am who I am by what I own. And the modern media kind of promotes this thought. But if we are serious about looking at the human condition, the idea of seeing oneself as king and queen of our existence is at the heart of all human condition. We are continually told that our value is determined by what we own and our happiness is determined by the things that we've accumulated and all that has really resulted in is a big trade imbalance where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer where there's stealing of resources of the powerful from the weak and where warfare comes as a result where those that have protect what they have from those that don't have. And we assess our leaders not by the quality that they are as a person but are by their ability to protect what I have and what you have. And into such world Jesus steps. It's the world of the New Testament. The Romans had conquered Israel. They had made Israel a, climate, a client state. They demanded loyalty. Rome was exporting the goods from Israel to other parts of the empire and what was left, they demanded taxes to be paid on all goods and services. And into this world, Jesus comes. And it's interesting to note that John's Gospel introduces Jesus as the voice of creation that called into existence all things and has now appeared in human form. And really, when you look at that opening phrase, it's the only way of which we can understand this gospel story, where Jesus takes five barley loaves and a couple of fish and feeds thousands of people. That creative power that he had in Genesis is expressed here. And the barley loaves, as opposed to wheat loaves, are the food of the poor. And the simple lesson that I think that we are supposed to be noticing, that the world has enough resources to feed 
all of God's people. If we but use God's agenda as the pattern by which we live. And there, there it is, the big if. Bernard Dozer in a book, The Dream of God, identifies that the world has faced three major falls. The first one was the fall in the garden, where Adam and Eve demanded to be king and queen of their destiny. The second one was when Israel demanded that they wanted their own king instead of God. And the third one happened at the time of Constantine, where the church went for an alternative to the empire, to actually being the empire where the church became king. That same impulse that's in Second Corinthian, uh, Second Samuel and in Constantine's time is that same impulse that it works in you and I. We demand to be king and queen. The church today, we talk about servanthood and justice. But we work really hard to maintain our imperial voice, to tell the world of what it should be and how what it should do. And in this passage where the people wanted to elect Jesus as king, he rejects that proposal. And instead of following as a church Jesus' model, we want to hitch our wagons to all the right stuff so that we may maintain our position of being king. In the feeding of the 5,000 is found in each of the four Gospels. And it invites us to reject the idea that stuff that we own, the stuff that we accumulate, is what sustains life and gives value. That our possessions will fill our spiritual void. It's really interesting today's gospel ends with the disciples heading across in a boat over the sea and they run into rough waters and high winds and when all seems lost, Jesus says, I am here. It's really interesting. It's one of the I am statements that is so often missed. We, we see Jesus as the I am the door, I am the life, I am the vine. I like this one most of all. Jesus says, I am here in the midst of our hard work. Jesus is here. Jesus was there for them. He is there. He was there. It's the same for us. His welcoming presence fills the space that we are in. And it transformed the fears of the disciples and it can do the same for us. And it transported them immediately to safety. But it required of them as it did of the little boy with the loaves and fishes to open their hands and their hearts to the king. What is John trying to tell us this morning? I think he's trying to tell us that when we let go of wanting to be king, when we release our grip on our loaves and fishes, the stuff that we've accumulated, Jesus becomes our companion. The word companion has at the very heart of it the one who shares bread. When we relinquish our quest to be king and queen, the bread of life becomes our daily bread. You and I, this morning, we face an invitation to confront the lie that our value is found in the things that we own and the things that we do. We face an invitation this morning to work with our appointed leaders, yes, but to remember at the core and at the heart of everything, that it is in God we trust. And as that passage today ends, Jesus withdraws to the mountain to be alone. So I want to finish with a couple of questions. If we were to withdraw day by day to be alone with Jesus, how might it shape our understanding of who we are? How might we allow him then to be our daily bread? How might it shape our fears 
and how might it shape the way that we use the resources with which we have been gifted. My challenge as I close, it is in trusting that we will find safety, security and fearlessness in our letting go. How countercultural is that idea? And that our deepest need and our truest hunger will be satisfied in the bread of life. I've written a song this morning that goes to the tune of what a friend we have in Jesus. I'm just going to put it up there for your reflection. It's shaped by some of my theology, the liberation theology, that Jesus is found in the way and in people that we don't often think and see the face of Jesus in. May God bless you. I offer it to you for reflection and prayer.
reading from Ephesians 3, verses 14 to 21, from the New Living Translation. Paul's prayer in response to God's mysterious plan revealed in Christ. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that cometh from God. Now all glory to God who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. You will no doubt have already noticed that the language in the passage of Ephesians has been featured in the liturgy throughout this service. We've listened to it at this point rather than before the gospel so that it's in our minds as we prepare to offer our prayers for the people. At the beginning of the gospel reading, Jesus and his disciples are confronted with a huge hungry crowd and Jesus turns to Philip and asks him, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? Poor Philip, he's not like the prophet Ezekiel whom we saw some weeks ago, confronted by a valley of dry bones and the spirit asking him, can these bones live? Ezekiel replied, O sovereign Lord, only you know. Good answer. Unlike Ezekiel, Philip fails to see God in the conversation or even possibility in the question. He only sees how impossible it is and replies, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Most of us are more like Philip than Ezekiel. I know I am. We are people of faith, but we often function as if we don't believe. We probably most see this in our committee meetings, where we look at the realities facing us, declining numbers, tightening budgets, unrealised missional plans, and we adjust our strategies and plans to be more realistic and sensible to be good stewards. And we must do these things. But at the same time, we need to remember that God, unlimited, gracious God, is prior to this and comes after it. We live in grace. We are loved by a God who is so abundant and beyond our understanding. We at Airport West accepted a challenge some months ago to commit to regular prayer for the future of our church. A couple of weeks ago at a worship committee meeting, Doug asked us about where we were talking about what we're hearing in our prayer. And we decided that starting today, we would give over the fourth Sunday to round table conversation and prayer, including Prayers for healing. As an aside, Doug also put on the table something he thinks we should be doing and the rest of us were quick to point out to him, Philip style, all the reasons we couldn't do it. Of course, we're not conversing around a table today, 
but the following prayers are designed to be contemplative. You are invited to offer your prayers to God who is abundantly generous, bigger than we can imagine, who gives us more than we ask for. There are a couple of places where the prayer ends with especially. This is where you are invited to pray your own prayers, first for healing and then prayers of thanksgiving. Let us pray. Gracious God of abundance, you feed the hungry from your hand and visit us in our storms. Hear your people as we pray for the whole world, saying, may we know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. So that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Give to your church, O God, the power to comprehend the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Christ, that your power at work within us may accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. May we know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. So that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Let all our leaders and all in authority bow their knees before you, O God, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name, that they may use their power justly, feed the hungry and share your abundance with all your children. May we know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. In every place of hunger, bring food. O God, in every place of poverty, bring abundance. In every place of terror, bring comfort and security. May we know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. So that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. to us in our stormy darkness and comfort us in our fears. With your generous touch, heal those for whom we pray, especially
Hear our thankfulness for the abundance of your grace, especially for... May we know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Hear our prayer, abundant God, and receive them in the spirit of the prayer your Son taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. As you go into the coming week, may your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvellous love. And all glory be to God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, one God, Holy Three, who is able to accomplish infinitely more than we would ever dare to ask or imagine. Go with God. Amen. May you know, may you know, may you know this. I want you and you to know this. How wide, how, wide, how, long, how long, how high, how high so deep. How wide, how, wide, how, long, how long, how high, how high so deep. deep is the love of Christ for you. May you know, may you know this I want you and you to know this How wide, how long, how high So deep, how wide, how long, how high So deep is the love of Christ for you Is the love of Christ for you 3 18.